This is Daybreak Australia. We're counting down to Asia's major trading opens here. And Heidi, at the outset, we're going to be tracking Japanese equities pretty closely because we're within a whisker now of the Nikkei 225 crossing that 40,000 mark. Yeah, uh, we're also watching Bitcoin, of course. We're what, about 10, 11 percent away from an all time high for Bitcoin. But uh, we're sort of coming back to uh, the fundamentals, right? Watching that inflation number out of the US, watching for Fed speak, more and more scrutiny over the eco data. So that print is going to be critical. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, really, that countdown to the core PCE reading and that bumpy path to achieving the 2% inflation target, the focus for investors as well over the course of this week. But we've got the opens here for Japan and South Korea. And at the start of trade, as I said, taking a look at how the Nikkei 225 is faring, uh, pretty flat at the start of the day. Uh, we did, as well worth noting, have some eco data out just in the last 10 minutes or so. And the numbers month on month, you're seeing industrial production there falling 7.5. That was worse than what economists had been expecting. There could be a bit of, uh, well, the, the production hold essentially Daihatsu over the course of January uh, playing certainly into those numbers because we saw that, that fall in production. This could be perhaps more of a shorter term blip. Year on year, actually, the reading was better than what had been expected. And retail sales as well out those numbers better than what economists had surveyed or, or what they had been forecasting both on the year on year and the month on month readings here so a little bit of a brighter spot for the Japanese economy the Japanese yen I mean we're continuing to hold around that 150 mark it really hasn't budged off that uh, for, for several days now but that is the state of play for Japan let's roll over and take a look at how Korea is coming online today as well uh, a little bit of weakness again, but fairly muted. And, and as we said as well, the, the dynamic here, perhaps Heidi, is just what we had in Wall Street overnight. More weakness creeping through, but that countdown, as we say, to the core PCE reading, given we have seen those inflationary pressures picking up again in the US economy. Yeah, it is really sort of, you know, the volatility going into this le last leg of the cycle, right, what that holds and uh, true of so many central banks, but a lot of them taking leadership from the Fed, of course. Take a look, Bell, at uh, some of the weakness that we're seeing across the Australian session at the moment, about three tenths of one percent lower, really some uh, selling that we're seeing in financials in particular. The mining sector isn't doing terribly well either, but really tracking that decline that we saw uh, through the U.S. session as well. We're seeing Kiwi stocks uh, also also a little bit on the back foot. Taking a look at the Aussie dollar, pretty steady, 64.95. We did see some pretty good gains for the dollar going into that inflation print at the moment. The dollar index is kind of going sideways at the moment. Still a little bit of weakness being held uh, by the Kiwi dollar there as well. We had uh, Governor Orr saying that the cash rate needs to stay at 5.5% this year. Remember, there was quite an elevated sort of outside risk of another hike coming through yesterday. Ultimately, obviously, they decided to hold. Uh, also, watching oil markets in particular we are seeing a bit more downside there just over 70 to 8 dollars a barrel there for new york traded crude oil extending that decline we saw that build up in u.s inventory uh inventory is really kind of creating a sense of caution there nationwide u.s stockpiles rising by 4.2 million barrels last week we're also watching uh that expectation of uh, opec plus nations to agree on crude output policy soon but of course a lot of focus when it comes to the treasury markets right in fact looking at the question as to whether yields have peaked for the year. That final core PCE data before the March FOMC will be key. The forecasts are for a slightly higher month-to-month -month number. Do we kind of finally see this, this uh, proper alignment of the rates markets with the Fed dot plots in pricing for the next uh, potentially three rate cuts this year? Let's get some answers on this. Our Chief Rates Correspondent for Asia and Live Contributor Garfield Reynolds is with us. I mean, Garfield, to your view, do you think we have seen a proper realignment and have we sort of stabilised or peaked? No, I, I think yields can go higher this hmm. year. Uh, you know, even if the PCE data comes in to the soft side, there are a whole range of other risks you know, go, going forward. And, and in particular, if we got a somewhat soft seat PCE print. We already had the strong CPI and jobs data you know, recently. Fed officials were emphasizing the idea that you know, they need to see a series of data that can give them confidence that they're really on the way and that they're not you know, about to be too calendar driven by, they're going to be data driven. So 
with that, you've, speaking of data, you've got PCE, then we also get the next jobs reading, we get a whole slew of your purchasing manager indexes and similar you know, gauges designed to take the temperature of various parts of the economy, both output and in particular what price pressures are doing. And you have uh, the Fed Chair Jay Powell appearing before Congress next week as well, after which Soon after that, they, the Fed then goes into a quiet period before you know, the next Fed meeting. So all the way through there, especially because the next Fed meeting will have an updated dot plot, you've got a range of risk factors which would tend to limit the downside for yields and provide the potential for a pop if we do get you know, um, so some, some data or some Fed speak that sounds pretty hawkish. We also could get higher yields if once we're past the month end rebalancing, equities regain their mojo and start to shift higher. And if there's strong risk appetite, it also becomes hard to see mm. you know, a, a top in for yields yet. Yeah, I mean, equities pushing higher, Garfield. Given the moves that we've seen, we have seen it sort of tapering off a little bit over the past few sessions, but how, how durable and how strong do you think the rally has been, or is this something that, that's pretty fragile still? Well, I, I think it's been very strong, and you know, to some extent, it's. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I've often been skeptical of equity moves, uh, but part of the difficulty of being skeptical about this one is that earnings have been strong, the economy has stayed strong, even you know, there were some wobbles within the GDP data that came out overnight. But consumer spending was better than expected. So uh, there's, there's that. There's also the financial conditions situation. It's interesting. I was looking at Goldman Sachs has indexes on financial conditions for Europe, financial conditions for the US. US financial conditions are actually somewhat loose, whereas Europe are fairly tight, even though you know, the ECB's cash rate is nowhere near as high as, as the Fed's. So you, you've got a range of factors which are saying there's no necessary reason, there's no sort of smoking gun for equities to turn around and move lower. They're definitely becoming more vulnerable, more exposed. Uh, you know, this talk of the, the equity premiums, equity risk premium get, becoming too compressed. Uh, so with all of that, you have to be apprehensive, but uh, you know, that you might miss time things all the same equities look at the moment like they've got the momentum and so far in the last few months momentum has been a winning strategy especially in Japan but not only in Japan so there's a good chance that equities are going to keep moving higher unless we get you know the sort of serious set of bad data that would mean there's a cap in yields that would mean the Fed is going to cut sooner rather than later. Well, we have seen some momentum and a bit of a rally, of course, is in Bitcoin. And, and we've, we've been discussing this morning the reasons for that. We know there's some supply-demand dynamics that are playing into it. There's leverage as well that's creeping back into the sector. But I'm curious, Bitcoin and, and crypto overall makes up such a small percentage of institutional investments. Do you think that we're likely to see any sort of pivot or change here? Well, not really. I, mean, I actually think Bitcoin's continuing to climb now. That, that underscores the idea that that risk appetite momentum is, is still you know, fairly strong. And I, I think that some of what's going on the last couple of days is rebalancing. Very strong month for equities, very weak month for bonds. So you've got some of those flows shifting around. You also have a lack of immediate equity triggers. Meantime, yeah, Bitcoin, it's got the supply demand dynamics it just fits that general zeke geist of you know things are doing well doing better than expected you know, if you remember part of the reason we, we entered this year bonds have done badly because we ended this year with people saying the fed is going to cut six times or maybe even seven times this year that underscored that people saw a lot of economic risks because the fed had hiked rates so much and it held them so high what do you know? The economy has done just fine with so far with yields at those levels, with, with rates at those levels. So I think there's something of, a, of an almost, well, OK, a relief rally for risk assets because 
the economy is remaining strong. All right, Garfield, that was Bloomberg's chief rates correspondent and MLive contributor, Garfield Reynolds, there. And you can get more on all of the day's trading on our Markets Live blog. That's on the Bloomberg at MLive Go. You can get a market rundown in one click. And there's commentary and analysis from Bloomberg's expert editors. So you can find out what's affecting your investments right now. Up next, we speak first with the RBNZ governor about why he's softening threats of further rate hikes this year and when he thinks they may start cutting. Adrian Orr joins us live next. This is Bloomberg. under 15 minutes into the session so far for Japan and Korea today and I think this board really puts it in perspective it, it's a lot of red across the screen here uh, but the decline so far they're, they're again they're still fairly range bound but we are seeing weakness creeping through it tracks what happened in Wall Street overnight so the focus really is coming down to the Fed's preferred inflation gauge that's due Thursday and that's going to help, of course, identify the path forward for interest rates here, given we have seen some signals creeping back into the market of more resurgent inflation. But as I said, uh, just about 15 minutes into the session, weakness for the Nikkei, for the Cosby here in Australia, is one hour into trade. Uh, what else we're tracking in the session so far is what's happening in the crypto space because Bitcoin has been one of the big movers over the past few days and uh, crypto stocks generally have, have uh, been one of the sectors to watch. But Heidi, again, it, it is that focus on, on the Fed and, and a course of other central banks, including, of course, the RBNZ. Yeah, it was a little bit of a surprise, I think, for certainly some market watchers yesterday that they did hold, uh, keeping rates unchanged, softening also its threat of a further hike. So that overall tone of the policy statement remaining somewhat hawkish, but much less so than investors had potentially been looking for. So joining us out of Wellington is the RBNZ Governor, Adrian Orr. Governor Orr, always a pleasure to have you here on Bloomberg. And uh, look, I think some people were surprised because there was speculation that there could be another hike. And, and you said it had been discuss. So talk us through the reasoning as to why you didn't go yesterday. Um, the data, I think, is really the story. <laughs> We've been very pleased with the last 18 months or so. Uh, the economy has panned out broadly as anticipated and we haven't had to change uh, our economic projections or views much at all, to be honest. Um, but markets, you know, will we'll pick the next 15 of um, changes um, that they try to make. The challenge for us, um, we had between November and our monetary policy statement yesterday, uh, a lot of confirmation that inflation has and is continuing to decline. Inflation expectations are being better re-anchored uh, and we're achieving uh, our targets with pretty minimum disruption to broader labour markets. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, you know, we retain a restrictive position, but at the moment we have the confidence um, that, you know, patients will see this through. Governor, was there a sense that it would have been also risky to raise rates as the economy is slowing, or does that not kind of weigh in the reasoning as much with a single mandate? And is there a sense that come April, potentially, that bar for a move is lower? Do, do you look at the fact that maybe more needs to be done to, to, uh, to look at the long-term neutral rate, right, to not kind of be running while still standing still, in a sense? 
Yes. So, you know, we believe with the official cash rate at 5.5 per cent, that is well above any estimate of a neutral interest rate for New Zealand. So, you know, we are comfortable. We are unambiguously in a restrictive monetary position. Um, you know, yes, there is always a risk of overdoing it um, at either end of monetary policy. Um, this is why patience is critical. So when you're sitting in a position where you're confident you're being restrictive, you're confident the economy and the monetary policy transmission is working as anticipated, then have patience. And that's what we were reflecting. Last November, um, you know, the inflation was still printing higher, expectations were higher, um, our projections were the same, but it's much nicer to actually have more data and more confirmation. So that's what we reflected. I think as well, um, you know, the, our forward outlook is, is balanced. You know, the, the risks either side around our inflation outlook. What hasn't been balanced is our ability to weather upside inflation surprises. That is, that's where the asymmetry is and our risk appetite as a committee. At 4.7% aiming for two, you don't want upside surprises. Patience is a mantra. Uh, I'm getting that. That is maybe one of the things that the markets and investors are, are, are not terribly good at, right? And you even said this morning that you see the cash rate as needing to stay at 5.5% through the course of this year. The markets are still pricing in, you know, to rate cuts. So do you want to give a message to investors, to the markets? Uh, you know, be careful. Um, the interest rates are at a restrictive level. <laughs> uh, engage the brain before you before you overindulge in, in debt. And um, if you're holding that debt with a view that interest rates have to go lower, that is your risk. It's not our risk. Our risk is to make sure inflation hits its target. What is the risk, though, that, that you're seeing of holding rates for perhaps too long? Yeah, at, at this point, um, low uh, in the sense that uh, uh, the economy is still strong. We're talking about uh, economic growth picking up from here over the calendar year. Uh, we're talking about uh, employment growth remaining strong. Uh, we do see unemployment rising somewhat, but other than that, you know, household incomes being very strong. Uh, there's a significant uh, government investment need. There's a lot of drivers of economic activity, and we're just trying to moderate um, the, you know, the, the demand side to to meet to match the supply capacity. So at the moment, you know, the risks are uh, balanced um, with the outlook. One of the factors that sort of played into those supply demand dynamics has been immigration because we have seen a big spike in net immigration in, in, in New Zealand. Did you look at that more from the in inflationary effect via the housing channel or was it more of the disinflationary effect on the labour supply? Yeah. Great question and um, and a complex one, as you well know. Um, not all migrants are the same and not every migration um, period is the same. The, we've had a 2% increase in our population, very similar to Australia, Canada, um, with a SNP migration. It's arrived at a time when there is enormous vacancies. People just could not find labour. So it has been a net positive on the supply capacity for the country. Um, the potential growth rate, and at the same time, it's moderated wage um, demands. So in that sense, uh, it has been useful for monetary policy, relieving some of the extreme pressure on the labour market. Uh, of course, though, there are now more people in the country, and they want dwelling, and um, they will be spending. So it is holding up, at some degree, uh, total spending in the country, Per capita spending is falling, but aggregate spending has been held up by the larger population. And the real pressure we see is actually in the dwelling market, not house prices, but rentals, places to live. So, um, you know, we're still in that really tough position. We, we just need more homes and houses, more dwelling. Do you think that rapid upswing in migration could actually fade pretty quickly? And does that pre take the pressure off rentals? Uh, I, you know, it's uh, we just don't try and predict. We make basic assumptions for immigration coming back to some long-term uh, normal standard. 
Um, why do we do that? Because no one can control um, the net migration. People can come and go as they like as citizens. Um, so uh, I think that the pressure will remain on rents for quite some time. Building um, activity is actually slowing from, from record levels at a time when the population has increased. So, um, you know, that rental challenge will be there, that rental price challenge for, for some time to come. The drop in inflation has been pretty rapid, 4.7% at the end of last year to 2.5% at the end of uh, this year. Do you continue to have confidence that the next, the last leg of this cycle will be quite as effective in terms of monetary policy settings? There's a lot of concerns, certainly stateside, about the stickiness of inflation and then you overlay some of the you know, geopolitical and potential supply chain issues that we might encounter this year. Is that a risk for the RBNZ? Uh, it is a risk. Uh, I don't think it's a new or different risk, however. You know, we've been um, doing a lot of work to see if the monetary transmission mechanism has changed at all, um, just how impactful are our interest rates on that domestic homegrown inflation. And all of our work says it's business as usual. Again, we just have to be patient. Uh, of course, you mentioned a couple of um, potential supply side or relative price risks. They're always going to exist. Uh, for example, uh, we, you know, we, we're talking about being inside the inflation target band the second half of this year, below 3%, and then uh, at 2%, not until the same time the following year. What's holding us up? Well, we've had to make some assumptions around some relative price pressures, um, including shipping costs, as an example. But, you know, the core role of monetary policy is working. We will always be buffeted by various relative price shocks. Yeah, I think that goes back to your point, Governor Orr, about the, the ability to weather upside surprises to inflation. So the risks of those really come down to, to New Zealand being a major commodity exporter. But what challenges are you most concerned by presently? Um, you know, domestically, I think the, the challenges are, I don't want to sound um, too... Uh, to benign sanguine, but you know the the, the risks are, are pretty well understood. There's um, nothing kind of on the horizon there. If anything, they are more global. The ones you've mentioned, the um, the geopolitical risks and challenge to trade, the cost of doing trade, uh, China demand. You know um, uh, 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 the the main risks we've talked about. Some to the upside and some to the downside. Our terms of trade have done reasonably well uh, over over recent months, you know. We and so the the uh, export sector is feeling um, a bit better about things. Um, so really, if we can, you know, ride out the next 12 months through through the last part of the disinflation, it's it's a pretty positive environment. The other thing that could perhaps become an inflation risk does come from the, a, a weak currency, and the New Zealand dollar is weak at the moment. Uh, of course, whether or not that's inflationary it depends on what that weaker exchange rate is reflecting. But do you think that the, the current levels of the, the Kiwi dollar can be explained? Uh, yes, I think that's, that's a great way you phrase it. Uh, you know, we don't have any unnecessary... Uh, or, or large unexplained components to our uh, trade-weighted exchange rate and, and likewise relative crosses. They have been reflecting very much um, any of the standard ways that you might try and model a fair value for an exchange rate within the zone of confidence around that. So, you know, the currency markets, touch wood, uh, have been very um, well behaved um, over, over recent times. Uh, so um, you say that we're kind of weak, I don't, you know, the, yes, we are lower than where we just were. It's not necessarily weak, it's reflecting uh, a lot of the economic fundamentals. There seems to be perhaps more preparedness across other major central banks. The Fed have started talking about easing, perhaps even the RBN, uh, the, uh, the RBA, I should say, despite being uh, one of the first at the start of this cycle, could the RBNZ potentially be one of the last cabs off the rank? to ease and are you comfortable with that in terms of that potentially then you know giving some strength to the currency and reducing the risk of imported inflation yes so you know all i can really say is the data will tell we'll have to play the hand that's in front of us um we are incredibly transparent you know we've put that projection out we're subject to no 
future economic shocks subject to the economy behaving um, broadly as expected, um, you know, we, we do have an easing of interest rates. Uh, it's just not any time soon. It's in a few quarters away. Uh, when we get far more confident and comfortable about easing is when inflation, actual inflation, is a lot closer to the target. And so, you know, we're, we're getting there, um, but uh, we're not there yet. Governor, you've talked a little bit about China and the slowdown, and I do wonder, you know, we've sort of gotten used to an environment where China has seen such extraordinary levels of growth. Do you think trading partners like New Zealand, very uh, externally exposed economies, have uh, adequately prepared with a future where we see a very structurally different rate of growth for China? Uh, I, I would say no. Um, I don't mean to sound... Um, controversial or panicked. Um, diversification of trade is critical. New Zealand went from being very concentrated to Europe, UK, to now being very concentrated um, Asia, China. We are more diversified than we used to be, considerably more, but we still have those concentration components. But more importantly, the value add is critical. The more, um, you know, fat you've got in the system that you can manage these different shifts in prices, you know, really just continuously trying to lift governor the value or, add. Governor, or we'll have to leave it there. Adrian Orr, they're the governor of the RBNZ. We do have some uh, breaking news just crossing the Bloomberg data, that is, when it comes to Australian retail sales numbers. Uh, this is a picture, as we see, a rise of 1.1%. The estimate was for an increase of 1.5%. Uh, this, as we also get some uh, data when it comes to fourth quarter business investment, seeing a rise of 8 tenths of a percent. That was better than expected. Uh, investment across buildings and structures, so capex rising 1.5% quarter on quarter. We are seeing a decline across some of those other aspects of equipment and machinery investment investment though down but just about 0.1% quarter on quarter then in terms of the planned spend 145 billion dollars roughly is uh, that 2000 uh, 2024 to 2025 estimate by Australian firms and uh, this as we continue to see some potential indications of uh, really some weakness across the last quarter of the year we heard from the Australian treasurer Jim Chan was not ruling out that the economy actually controls contracted in the final three months of 2023, saying that uh, elevated inflation, the rate increase cycle likely weighed on growth. And we have just been speaking to, of course, Bell, the RBNZ governor, and, and at this point in the cycle, there's so much scrutiny on each data point and how much that potentially contributes to these market expectations uh, of easing to come. Yeah, that's right. It really seems like the bar for any sort of hikes or, or further action from here, if it's not going to be a cut, it is very much uh, uh, under the microscope here. But taking a look at one of the stocks that's just started trading here, this is the Japanese lender Aozora, and that stock there is absolutely surging up more than 15% at this point in time. What's happened is we've had City Index, that's a firm that's linked to active an activist investor in Japan, has disclosed taking a holding or a stake in the company or is it and so essentially uh, what we're hearing about that stake or we're hearing from City Index is that they're going to be uh, with that 5.4% stake perhaps putting forward some sort of proposals to Aozora as well. Uh, Aozora is a, as I said, a Japanese lender. Its stock has really plunged over the past few weeks and what's been really behind that has been the bank saying that it expects to post a net loss for the fiscal year and uh, that's given and pretty much some bets on U.S. commercial property that turn sour. So uh, Azora, yes, up 15%, but still put in context, it's rapidly dropped over the past few weeks. Uh, but let's shift now to something else, another data set we're going to be tracking later today, and that's India's fourth quarter GDP numbers that are due later Thursday. A Bloomberg survey expects 6.6% growth from a year earlier. It does remain the world's fastest expanding major economy. Uh, government spending and private investment have moderated, though, ahead of this year's elections. With us now is Radhika Rao. She's the executive director and senior economist at DBS. So Radhika, yeah, start us off with what you're expecting from this print. Uh, thank you, Annabelle. Uh, I think certainly, like you rightly mentioned, 
uh, you know, the growth numbers are expected to be quite strong. In fact, uh, India works on a fiscal year basis. Uh, and if you bake in our expectation, which is a bit higher than consensus, we expect about 6.8%. If you uh, to see the third three quarter, uh, you know, average, it's well above 7%. Uh, so certainly more pluses than minuses in the data outcome that we expect later today. Uh, you know, we do think the consumption is going to be doing better. Uh, I think it's a bit of change of hands between urban India and rural India. If you look at some of the high frequency numbers. Uh, so and there was festivities as well uh, in that quarter. So we do think that would have uh, provided um, you know, some support to consumption. Uh, but the bigger story is certainly investment growth, uh, investment growth by the government. Uh, you know, for even residential uh, uh, construction, for example, inventories are those low. So uh, there too, you're seeing some buoyancy, um, and uh, and the private sector is participating in the sectors where you know public capex is going. So if you talk about uh, roads and railways, metals, power, those are some of the sectors that are seeing uh, uh, you know some investment interest. And finally, the external sector certainly slower global growth um, is a risk. Uh, but for India, uh, you know it, the the weakness in goods uh, deficit is being offset by what's happening on the services front. Uh, so that's again providing um, support to the external trade math. Uh, so in all, I think uh, quite a strong run rate when you talk about the first three quarters uh, of the fiscal year uh, 24 that we are in at currently. And so how sustainable do you think that is, Radhika? I mean, we've spoken to so many people about just India being such a great structural growth story now. You know, several things have. I mean, there, there are many. Um, um, how do we put it? You know, the actors uh, of production that are well placed as we go into the new year, um, new fiscal year. That is, you've got elections coming up uh, in April, May. Uh, no, if when you look beyond that, uh, the private sector in particular is quite well placed. I mean, they are uh, under leveraged. Uh, you've also seen, you know, capital in capital markets are doing well. So they're able to, you know, raise capital if they require. They're using internal accruals also to fund some of the capex um, and consumption. Again, you know, uh, you see uh, some signs of turnaround in the part of labor participation rate, uh, and also way, you know, jobs in general doing better. Uh, so structurally, I think it is um, quite a investment-driven, uh, you know, growth push that we have seen last year, and I, we do expect that to to continue in the year ahead as well. Um, you know, pro probably the elections, there'll be a, a bit of a moderation and after the elections, uh, it will pick up. Um, and the overall, you know, like I mentioned, the trade mix is something that's providing a buffer against what's happening globally. Uh, risks, of course, you know, one should watch out for. And I think those risks are much more exogenous uh, in, uh, in, our, in our view. I think one is, of course, how global growth goes. And the second is the commodity price cycle. Uh, you know, if that turns uh, detrimental, I mean, that will impact um, India's external balances, for example. Uh, but uh, insofar as the domestic story is concerned, we do think that the investment and uh, consumption push is something uh, that is providing a good buffer uh, to the economy in an environment where you're really seeing, um, you know, slow down risks uh, in the region or at least the G3 countries. With those slowdown risks, do you think the RBI could afford to be less hawkish as it is? We just had some numbers from Bloomberg Economics saying that potentially uh, the actual levels of inflation could be half a percentage point lower than the headline number uh, you know, officially released. Is there a sense that uh, they're being too cautious here? Um, I, I guess you're ref referring to the recent expenditure, um, you know, consumption expenditure survey that was released. Uh, now, what that was released after a decade, and what that showed us is that, uh, you know, it, patterns have changed in so far as how households are spending. They used to spend much more on food uh, about a decade back. Uh, they're doing less so now. Uh, they're spending more on non-food. So when I say non-food, it could be conveyance, uh, you know, rent, depending on whether it's urban India or rural India. Uh, so. When you see those consumption patterns change, I think one is drawing a conclusion that if those weights are reflected in a current CPI inflation basket, inflation actually would be trending lower. So we would quite agree, though I, I don't think that reweighting exercise is going to happen yet. They're waiting for subsequent rounds of the survey to happen. Uh, but certainly it's telling you that changing consumption patterns uh, suggest lower inflation. Uh, coming back to your question of what that means for the RBI, uh, you know, they have drawn quite a Goldilocks, um, you know, backdrop growth at about 7% for the year we're going to go into. Inflation at about four and a half, still above target. Uh, you know, they, and, and their commentary has been more hawkish and positive on growth. Now, against this backdrop, 
you know, it's not, it doesn't suggest that there is a dovish pivot uh, which is imminent. Uh, so that's why after their commentary, you've seen the rate cut expectations being, you know, parred. Uh, our own take is uh, we don't expect rate cuts before it is the final quarter of this calendar year. Uh, so suddenly expecting them to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, to wait to see what the Fed is doing and also wait to see the domestic inflation story uh, play out. Is that a potential risk? And, and what, what other risks do you see for the second half? Uh, there's a lot of geopolitical risks this year, for sure. Yeah, I mean, them holding rates um, high, uh, you know, for longer period of time certainly keeps tight financial conditions quite tight. Um, but at this this juncture, you know, like, like I mentioned, most of the... Uh, you know, corporate sector for particularly, you know, paid back some of their debt instead of, uh, you know, building on more debt. So I think they're better placed from that perspective. Uh, but certainly high rates for long hurt. Uh, and I think most of the risks could be external uh, for the second half of the year. Uh, you know, the Middle East tensions are very important, especially for oil. You also seen those, uh, you know, Red Sea attacks on commercial liners, uh, which is slowing down or adding costs uh, to the to the trading community. Uh, so I would think I would I would rank it such that global growth slowdown uh, and the commodity cycle are the two big uh, risks uh, for the economy in the second half of the year, uh, and domestically, of course, will be you know how inflation plays out uh, because it's quite uh, you know part of the basket is quite prone to what's happening on the climate. Front. Radhika, always great to chat with you. Radhika Rao, Executive Director and Senior Economist at DBS. We do have some breaking news uh, on Donald Trump. An Illinois judge has removed Donald Trump from the ballots because of, quote, ins the insurrectionist ban. This comes as quite a surprise move where the judge in Illinois has removed the former president, Donald Trump, from the state's ballot based on the 14th Amendment so-called insurrectionist ban. Uh, that decision comes as part of a similar anti-Trump challenge that we've seen in the state of Colorado that's pending before the U.S. Supreme Court, and that is widely expected to reject arguments that Trump is barred from office. Cook County Circuit Judge uh, Tracy Porter heavily relied on the prior finding by the Colorado Supreme Court, calling uh, that rationale compelling, realising that the magnitude of deci the decision, the impact on the upcoming primary Illinois elections, uh, they have decided to remove Donald Trump from the ballot for the general primary election to take place on March 19th of this year. So that is uh, one month after the anti-Trump challenge was dismissed by the Illinois State Board of Elections. This was a unanimous and bipartisan vote by the election board because it said it didn't have jurisdiction to review the matter. This now, I believe, makes Illinois the third state where Trump has been booted from the ballot after Colorado and Maine. But those decisions were paused pending the appeal of that Colorado case to the Supreme Court. Uh, we're also seeing that the Supreme Court will weigh uh, his bid for immunity from criminal prosecution as well. We'll talk more on trade next. Bloomberg is at the World Trade Organization Ministerial Conference in Abu Dhabi. You can catch our conversation with the U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai later on Thursday on Bloomberg Surveillance. More to come here on Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg. Taking a look at how crypto stocks are faring in the session today, and it's just another session of gains really here across the board. And, and the, the reason underpinning that, of course, you can see Bitcoin in the bottom of your screen here. But above that 60,000 mark, trading at a two-year high, uh, earlier edged as close as nearly 64,000. But uh, a lot of different factors playing into that in terms of spot Bitcoin ETFs, the demand for those, the supply, dyna supply demand dynamics off the back, leverage as well. Let's get more with our Asia finance reporter, Suva Gosh joining us from Singapore and uh, Suva perhaps you're not quite re ready for us just yet but uh, I will continue to talk about what we're seeing really because as I said it's, it's supply demand and spot Bitcoin ETFs they launched back in January so you're now around probably around the six week mark of those being live and and we have seen significant investor flows coming into those really uh, and given that it has driven up the demand for Bitcoins 
that's not really being met with the supply that's coming through from the miners here. So uh, that's certainly one of the things. And as I said, leverage uh, is also another factor. But let's get more because I think Suva now is ready to join us from Singapore. And Suva, yeah, I just spoke about the spot Bitcoin ETFs, the demand, but I didn't get too much into the supply demand. What are we seeing with the Bitcoin miners? Can they just start to issue more tokens? Exactly. It's a busy day for all of us, uh, Annabelle, and thank you for having me here. Uh, actually, uh, it is, as you rightly said, a, a big supply-demand mismatch uh, where we are seeing a lot of uh, spot demand coming from the ETF, uh, the exchange traded funds for spot, spot Bitcoin. And mostly this is happening in the U.S. Uh, hours because the, the, the trading is happening in U.S. hours. The ETFs are in the U.S. So we are seeing a large amount of demand from the U.S. for the U.S. ETF. Funds that is actually skewing the, the supply demand uh, equation for Bitcoin. Uh, of course, we have to also remember that uh, the potential halving, the halving, which is potentially reducing the supply growth of Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoins basically because, because Bitcoin is fixed, the supply is fixed. That is also kind of creating a you can say a FOMO among traders that what if I don't get the Bitcoins at this kind of prices later? So that's again adding to the demand uh, for for this, uh, you know, the, the, la 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 the largest cryptocurrency that we have. And that's, again, uh, leading to this frenzy in the market. Uh, I can see that. Uh, but however, I have to also uh, add that the leveraged long positions have significantly gone up in the market. Uh, which means that there could be a pullback, uh, a technical pullback, if even if that is short-lived, uh, because again, as I, I, as we we seen that the demand might continue to go, but we can see some kind of uh, pullback happening given the very leveraged long positions and the funding rates to for, for these positions going up significantly. Savashri, what are we seeing in terms of the volumes of Bitcoin leverage, and what does it tell us about this rally? The volumes and the leveraged uh, uh, business is going up very much. Like you know, in the yesterday it was uh, it, uh, the the funding rates were sharp, uh, record high. We are seeing the volumes uh, going up mostly in the U.S. hours, which is actually showing that the the, the rally might sustain going ahead. Uh, but you would see that uh, you know in the Asian hours we can see some kind of pullback because as I said that. The, the, driven, the rally is driven from the ETFs in the U.S. So there, we are seeing some kind of pairing, some kind of you know sober uh, uh, sober movement as we speak in the Asia hours. But this could be again a very temporary factor, given that uh, traders are really really looking at uh, the the soon uh, the, the record high levels, which is which is the next big level we are watching for as well, uh, which which could be a big big domino effect if that that gets touched or breached in the next few days. All right, uh, Suva, I'm sure you've got a busy few days ahead just tracking this ascent of Bitcoin, but that was our Asia finance reporter there, Suva Ghosh in Singapore. And let's uh, shift now to Hong Kong because uh, the real estate sector is facing an uphill battle even after the government's most forceful attempt yet to revive the market. Authorities have eased home buyer levies and mortgage lending restrictions as part of sweeping measures to revive the financial hub. Our Hong Kong real estate reporter, Shauna Kwan, joins us. And uh, Shauna, I mean, we were just discussing there in the break that that this was something that really took people by surprise yesterday the move yeah I think it's um, it's actually better than people um, expected because all of these so-called spicy measures are removed so in the past foreign buyers have to pay um, a combined 15% tax of probably transactions and Hong Kong existing homeowners have to pay 77.5% sorry mm. so now everyone paid the same tax that is kept at 4.25% and um, also the special sub duty that is imposed on uh, sellers who sell their properties within two years of purchase is also scrapped mm. so everyone is free to sell the properties anytime they want What is the impact that we see on home prices in this year? So I think most analysts is um, are expecting are expecting um, prices to stay flat or even um, drop by a slow single digit. Um, so a lot of that will hinge on the the rate cuts. So if we see um, rates go lower this year, people will find it more affordable to um, buy homes in Hong Kong. 
Our Hong Kong real estate reporter, Shauna Kwan, there. Staying in Hong Kong, Bloomberg Intelligence sees the city's tourism and retail gains slowing after the first quarter of this year. Let's get more from BI Senior Asia Pacific Consumer Analyst Catherine Lim. So, Catherine, should we be more excited about the prospect of increased China tourism into the city after hearing uh, some of these initiatives being announced? Right. It's great to actually see the government putting in more money, um, looking to actually prop up activities for tourists, such as monthly um, fireworks, um, you know, monthly drone shows. But really, I don't think it's going to be quite enough to actually try and bring numbers up significantly, particularly do bear in mind that we are still far off from where tourism levels were um, back in 2018 um, to 19 before the protests happened. And we ended off at 49% of those levels. I think it's going to go up to about 58%, um, factoring in a 29% year-on-year growth in tourism numbers. Um, I think that is going to be just about it based on what we've actually seen um, yesterday from measures taken by the government. Fingers crossed on those. <laughs> but, uh, Catherine, given that, that Hong Kong's retail landscape has relied so heavily on Chinese tourism, especially for the luxury segment, how is that sort of likely to then play out on retail sales then? Well, do you know what? It is interesting that we've actually recently started seeing some of the luxury brand stores, um, you know, popping up again um, in um, Hong Kong, um, notwithstanding we've got um, a few more of the Bulgaris, the Chanel's actually coming up. And um, it will be interesting to actually see how they manage some of the marketing activities, particularly since they've actually raised prices in Greater China in the last six months itself. So doing more of these campaigns to actually bring out um, you know, some of the uh, messages or the stories behind the brand, I think that's going to actually still be a draw for the Chinese shoppers, particularly since there are still price differences between luxury goods um, selling in China as well as Hong Kong. Hong Kong obviously you know, being um, you know, cheaper given the absence of taxes. So I do think that you know, the luxury guys are still going to be doing well in Hong Kong. Um, bear in mind though that we're seeing a moderation in terms of tourism numbers increase. So the magnitude of the increase may not be as significant as what we've seen in 2023. Catherine, that was our senior Asia analyst, uh, senior analyst rather for Asia Pacific consumer, Catherine Lim there from Bloomberg Intelligence. And you can get an insider's guide to the money and people shaking up the finance hub in our new Hong Kong edition newsletter out every Thursday. You can sign up via Bloomberg.com slash newsletters. We'll have more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Taking a look at some of the corporate stories we're following this morning, and NVIDIA Insiders sold about $80 million worth of stock after the chipmaker's earnings beat sent shares to a fresh record. According to the Washington Service, Insiders unloaded the most stock in a month since September. NVIDIA's latest results topped elevated expectations while also delivering another strong revenue forecast. Microsoft is investigating reports that its co-pilot chatbot is generating responses that users have called disturbing and sometimes harmful. The chatbot was introduced as a way to weave AI into a range of Microsoft products and services. The tech firm says some users have deliberately tried to fool co-pilot into generating the responses. Video game publisher Electronic Arts is cutting 5% of its workforce, or about 670 people. EA cites shifting consumer needs or customer needs and a refocusing of the company. It's also stopping development on an undisclosed number of games. That's it from Daybreak Asia. Our market coverage continues as we look ahead to the start of trade in Hong Kong, Shanghai and Shenzhen.